Okay, perfect. So I'll begin this afternoon's session with a brief introduction. Welcome to the IEA Bioenergy webinar series hosted by the Canadian Institute of Forestry. My name is Natasha Machado, and I will be kicking off today's session. Today is Thursday, April 25th, 2019, and we are very pleased to have five speakers with us today who will present five carefully selected case studies on biomass pretreatment options to diversify the resource base. We are also very pleased to have Yap Kopshen, who will be the moderator for today's session. To, to start things off, YAP was a leader of Task 32 until the end of 2018, which focuses on biomass combustion and co-firing. He is the founder and managing director of Proceed Biomass BV, a contract R&D company involved in the develop and market introduction of bioenergy technologies, with a clear focus on biomass combustion and gasification. YAP is also a technical director at Bioforce BV, a renewable energy service company using advanced biomass combustion technologies to produce heat and power. And with that, I will now pass it over to YAP to introduce today's topic and the speakers for today's session. Yes, thank you, Natasha, for this nice introduction. Uh, I'll see if I can use the mouse also with this. Is that possible, Natasha? Uh, or can I? Oh, yeah, I see it here. Okay. Um, so uh, I would just like to welcome everyone to this uh, to this webinar. Um, we have uh, five speakers, as, uh, as said before, and uh, uh, um, the names are here on the title slide uh, for the people involved, and I will introduce them uh, later on also. The topic is uh, field retreatment of biomass residues for thermal conversion. So this, was, um, uh, this is the result of an inter-task project within IA Bioenergy, where different tasks uh, within the bioenergy uh, uh, technical collaboration program uh, collaborated, uh, um, worked together on this, on this project, as it is really a multidisciplinary uh, uh, project now. Um, I will go to the second slide. Uh, so the aims of this project um, uh, and the approach was really to demonstrate uh, how uh, existing bioenergy chains can be made more still flexible, efficient, cost-effective by applying pretreatment technologies or a combination of pretreatment technologies. Um, so we have five case study reports, which you will hear about uh, over the next uh, uh, 40 minutes or so. Uh, then we'll have uh, 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 one of the deliverables, which we will not talk about uh, right now, is, uh, is a module within the existing IA Bioenergy database. Uh, it's a, a technology database where you can find information about existing gasifiers and uh, um, uh, co-firing installations and whatever. Um, and uh, the new is that, is that there is also now a module where you can find the treatment facilities, for example, for a faction plan. Then uh, the third output of this project was a policy report, and uh, I will share some of the main results of that also in the next uh, couple of minutes. There's a website uh, about this project. It's, uh, it's this is shown here below, ITC field pretreatment, field treatment .com. If you go to the main iabioenergy.com website, you will also find it there. Uh, the project team uh, consisted of people from five different tasks uh, within IA Bioenergy. So we have uh, uh, Michael Hill, uh, who is also presenting today. He um, uh, did, did uh, case study one together with lots of people from the University, from, uh, from Canada, but also from Finland, uh, where the people that were involved in case study two. Uh, this is a case study on uh, forest residues, woody residues. Uh, the third case study was done by, uh, uh, by uh, people from Task 33. Uh, this is uh, people who work active in gasification. So Kevin uh, Whitty is, uh, is available today to present this, but also Inga Johansson from RISE in Sweden and Dieter Stapp from KIT in Germany and Giovanni Fissery from Italy were involved. Then uh, case study four was, uh, was done by uh, people from, uh, from Task 32, uh, together with people from, uh, from industry. Uh, this is a case on uh, steam explosion. And we have a uh, case study five on uh, uh, leaching biomass, herbaceous biomass, which was done by Wageningen University in the Netherlands. Uh, as said before, I, I, I coordinated this project on behalf of Task 32, and people from Exco were also involved. The database programming was done by people from ASEAN Bioenergy 2020. 
So for today, we will uh, we'll have an introduction by myself, and the case studies uh, will end up with some conclusions, and then there's room for questions and answers. Uh, so please collect your questions, uh, uh, and there's room for um, uh, for addressing these at the end of this webinar. So just to start off my introduction, we we are of course uh, dealing with the transition from a fossil-based energy system to a more renewable energy system, which is uh, largely bio-based also. Um, so if you look at, uh, at the fossil fuels and compare that with biomass-based fuels, you see that there's quite large diversity in chemical composition and uh, physical appearance of these biomass resources. Um, but uh, on the other hand, we see uh, an infrastructure that's mainly designed for fossil fuels. And, uh, uh, the specifications of these fuels are not all, always in compliance, so there's a mismatch um, in many cases. So something needs to be done uh, if you'd like to get the biomass in the ex existing infrastructure. Then um, a, a very practical and economical uh, aspect is that we see quite bulky biomass material with low polymetric energy densities, and this causes high transportation costs. So there's always a desire to increase that and uh, uh, use a densification technology. Um, and we see also, looking at these fossil-based assets, we see uh, uncertainty about uh, the availability of these assets on the longer run. And that makes these plant owners hesitant to, to invest in, in, in large changes of these, uh, these assets. So this, this, um, this makes it more interesting to go to commodity fuels that are compatible with uh, with these uh, uh, energy um, using devices. Um, so there's a that's also a driver to go to free trade. And uh, as I said, uh, there are various free trade technologies already available, and some are upcoming that can improve uh, the situation. So looking at uh, some, um, some figures for biomass availability, there are various projections available in, in, in literature, but this is just one of the tables that I took. Uh, and we see here that uh, looking at crop residues, manure and MSW, these are uh, quite, um, quite uh, known, I think, because we know uh, more or less how much manure is produced, how much MSW we will produce. Uh, in a couple of decades from now. Uh, the, the large uncertainty arises when we look at bioenergy crops, where we don't know yet what uh, uh, diets people will use. Uh, this has a, an implication for some land use and the availability of, of land uh, for growing bioenergy crops. So uh, th there's a quite large uncertainty around that. Um, for forest residues, also, there's some uncertainty around it. But uh, uh, the other but um, biomass resources are quite firm in nature. And we look at, on the other hand, on the, uh, the demand for, for fuels in, uh, in the current uh, fossil-based energy structure, energy system. Uh, we see uh, here a couple of graphs from uh, an, uh, a study done by DNVGL, which is also involved in this project, uh, namely Energy Transition Outlook. Um, and, uh, uh, it, it, it has graphs for future uh, demand of uh, uh, coal and oil and natural gas. And you see here in this projection uh, uh, sectoral uh, energy demand. And you see uh, on the orange graph uh, is for power generation. And the, the blue the part of the, of the graph is for industry demand. So in case of coal, we see a lot of uh, coal is currently being used for power generation and also for um, uh, for manufacturing industry. And uh, this, this could be interesting to, to target with biomass. Um, here also for natural gas, we see a, a growing demand also still for power generation. Uh, and uh, for oil, it's of course mainly used in transportation. Uh, keeping that in mind, uh, uh, we can look at some market opportunities. So looking at the power sector, for example, you see here on the top uh, row that uh, uh, there's about 100 exajoules of coal currently being used, which, which could be replaced. But if you would like to use biomass in this sector, then there are some 
technical requirements. It needs to have a high ash melting point. It needs to be easily grindable to be used in a pulverized coal-fired power plant. And it needs to be hydrophobic uh, also. And uh, the logistical cost needs also, also needs to be acceptable. So um, we can then look at uh, the availability of, of woody biomass, herbaceous biomass, and solid biomass. And uh, here there are some in the table some pre-treatment options to, to get there. So uh, currently there's, uh, there's quite uh, a large trend to go to uh, white pellets for, for coal firing, replacing coal for electricity uh, use, but uh, black pellets could also be the case. So we have two case studies in our project, one and four, uh, that target this, uh, this market. Uh, some other options which I just would like to mention, uh, I already mentioned coal for uh, manufacturing industry. Uh, there's about seven activities today around the world being used for, for, for cement production. And uh, we have one case study here on using MSW fuel for uh, replacing coal. Uh, so that's case study three, which you, which you will hear about. This is quite relevant. Um, another case study uh, was performed on uh, uh, herbaceous biomass, which is quite the elephant in the room, looking at the, the potentials that we have, about uh, 49 exadules, as we showed previously. So this is a large uh, biomass resource, which is quite underutilized at the moment. And uh, there are options to use this either for power generation or for industrial use. So there's one case study about that as well. And then, um, of course, woody biomass can also be used uh, for space heating. There's also still quite a large demand and the 30 exadules as shown here. And uh, uh, there are options to improve that. So with that, uh, I think uh, we should start with the case studies. Uh, we have five case studies available here. And uh, I will, would like to start immediately with the first one, which is uh, going to be presented by Michael Wilk from the International Biomass Protection Council in Austria. He's also working with uh, Wilton Partner, a consulting uh, agency. Uh, so Michael uh, will talk about uh, biomass protection as, a, as an alternative to wood cell for coal firing. Uh, Michael has a long history in, uh, in renewable energy, about 30 years. He's, uh, he's, he's worked in uh, biomass fired district heating systems in Austria, uh, biomass coal firing in Europe, uh, biomass trading, both on the internet, but also uh, uh, pra very practically overseas transport and shipments of, uh, of biomass. He has been the delegate in, uh, in this in task 40 for, uh, for about 12 years. And uh, uh, Michael, I would like to hand over the mic <coughs> to you. Thank you very much, Jaap. And I hope everybody can hear me well. Um, yes, we, we undertook uh, the first uh, case study here, um, and uh, this case study was um, comparing uh, the full value chain uh, for white wood pellets versus torrified pellets. So what we were, wanted to undertake here is simply a proof that there is reason to live for the new kid on the block, the torrified pellet. Um, and I will speak always about torrified pellet here because uh, in the market I see a certain confusion because there's always the expression of black pellets and then nobody knows is it now from steam explosion process, from torrefaction process, from eventual carbonization process. Um, we re refrain and say torrefied, torrefied pellets or torrefied wood is uh, the focus here. So. Um, we took um, value chains, in reality supply chains, from production sites um, on the island of Kalimantan in Indonesia to Japan. That was taken because this is new emerging routes now with the market in Japan uh, starting to grow in consumption. Uh, but as you will see later on, we did generalize the, the, um, the results a little bit um, uh, and uh, uh, causing by this then also uh, an extrapolation. We looked into uh, the uh, chain from really harvesting uh, the, uh, the wood in the fields in Indonesia, the overall pre-processing, transportation to a processing plant, so to a, a pelleting or a torrefaction pelleting plant, all the storages, all inland transport uh, down to the export harbor, all the exercises undertaken in the harbor to load the vessel, 
the uh, the ocean shipping uh, to uh, the destination harbor, uh, all the exercises undertaken in the import harbor, the inland transport to the customer, uh, and the storage at the end customer. We did not look uh, into uh, eventual effects and savings uh, at the end customers or at the coal power plant or another consumer of the torrefied biomass. Um, just briefly before, in case anybody of you has not uh, had access to torrefaction or doesn't know about torrefaction, which I doubt, but anyhow, quickly repeat it. Torrefaction is a process um, which is uh, exposing uh, biomass, independent of which kind of biomass it, it, it is, to heat. By these, some of the volatiles of the uh, biomass is evaporated and the best is brought out of the biomass. A typical process is the coffee roasting, where through torrefaction the best of uh, tastes and flavors is brought into the beans, which is then extrapolated in the in the steam process. Uh, we, in uh, energy uh, purposes, we condensate the energy in the uh, biomasses through torrefaction. This is shown here with one of these uh, heat and energy balances uh, for a torrefaction process. This process is set up in a way that it is autothermal operated, so all the uh, net calorific value which is evaporated through the volatiles is then rejected into the combustion for the drying of the biomass, and by this no energy is wasted. The overall mass and energy balance of the production itself of the torrefied uh, biomass here is almost equal to the one of white wood pellets as some mass and energy balance comparisons by ECN on behalf of IPDC have been shown. Now, uh, we compare by these now torrefied biomass with a calorific value of around 22 megajoule per kilogram to white wood pellet of approximately 17 megajoule per kilogram. Um, torrefied product compared to white wood pellets has by these now the advantage of having a higher energy uh, contents per kilogram. And as we have almost the same, uh, if not the superior bulk density with our product, the volumetric energy density of uh, the product in all the logistics chain and handling is approximately 40% better than uh, in white wood pellets. On top, Torrified biomass, if densified, uh, becomes almost hydrophobic, water resistant, meaning especially uh, in storage and in the handling in the port. This is a big advantage because there is uh, no uh, fear or no need for sheltering the product continuously. Also, a limited biodegradation uh, uh, results in no CO emissions uh, in storage and during the shipping of the product, which, in, which is decreasing the hazards of the product in handling and storage uh, significantly. Uh, we will prove lower logistical costs and at the end customer, then the better grindability and the much better uh, combustion characteristics or combustion characteristics which are much closer to coal um, are also a big advantage. Now, let's see what the results of our chain analysis has been. Um, you will see uh, many more detailed graphs in the study which was introduced by YAP before. Please feel free and look into this. This is just a kind of a summary. If we compare the two chains and the energy consumption along the chain, we see white wood pellet and torrefied wood pellet that the main consuming factor in the full value chain, in both value chains, is the drying. So the evaporation of the water from the raw feedstock uh, to be processed any further. This is almost equal between the two chains and it is independent of what product you're processing, always clever to evaporate this water as close as possible to the resource to avoid transporting water. But when you compare then later on the whole segment after processing, the energy consumption in torrefied wood pellets in the red and in the right uh, column and on the left hand column for the white wood pellets, you see that especially in this handling and transport section, torrefied white uh, wood pellets have an advantage of about 40% in energy consumption uh, versus the white wood pellets. 
This only distance for uh, about 4,000 uh, uh, nautical miles uh, of transportation. And we see that the dominant factor is the overseas uh, shipping. We have been uh, analyzing here handy size shipments, as this is the most common uh, size in shipping of uh, pellets nowadays. If you compare or if you like to generalize now these, these analysis and compare with other routes uh, which are common for uh, wood pellet transportation, you see, at, and this is, I think, no surprise, the longer the distance of shipping, the bigger the advantage of the torrified product and the uh, higher the uh, savings in energy consumption uh, per gigajoule of transported fuel for the torrified products. You see also there are here some typical routes like Southwest Canada to Japan or Southwest Canada to Netherlands, Southeast U U US to Japan and similar routes. So here you can compare what the savings in megajoule per gigajoule uh, of supplied product to the end customer will be. This obviously also uh, translates into greenhouse gas relevant gas emissions and fuel, uh, fuel, uh, fuel gas emissions uh, in the transport. And here we see that the torrified wood pellets have about uh, a 15% advantage versus the white wood pellets in a full chain analysis of greenhouse gas relevance. This is very relevant when we look into the benchmark which are set by the EU, EU Commission now for greenhouse gas substitution to receive subsidies in co-firing. We have a third column here and I'd like to uh, address this in particular because wood pellets, uh, they uh, are a world market by now, but originally they started to exist because there was existing uh, pelleting technology from the feed sector. For torrified product, we see that pelleting is rather difficult, but uh, highly carbonized material behaves in densification like coal or like many other materials which are densified in briquettes. Briquettes consume much less electricity in production and by uh, mingling different sizes of uh, briquettes into a bulk uh, storage you can uh, increase the shipping and bulk density significantly. So if the same torrified wood which is before pressed in pellets is pressed in briquettes the reduction in greenhouse gas relevant emissions is even more uh, significant and by this more relevant. So this is for sure also an option which uh, parties should look into into the future. We have also undertaken an economic analysis and here we have uh, presented an economic analysis which was undertaken by TAS32 in 2011. Basically economics and analysis of economics is analyzing, analyzing moving targets so you never can uh, be sure if all the numbers is, is right. But we prove with whatever analysis we undertake the torrified pellets at the nozzle of the boiler or at least at the, uh, at the um, uh, stockyard of the customer is significantly cheaper per uh, gigajoule of energy supplied than white wood pellets are nowadays. So aside of all the advantages of torrified product we have uh, listed before, we see also that there is significant cost advantages. The product is more competitive in international supply chains and therefore we do foresee that this will be one of the winners in the future. We have also seen uh, during our analysis that first larger commercial plants uh, are in construction and we can understand that by 2020 at least two or three plants of capacities larger than 100,000 kilotons per year will be in production. By this I return to YAP. Thank you very much. Yes, uh, thank you Michael uh, for that. Uh... For that explanation, uh, I think we go to the next uh, case study immediately, which is done by Evelyn Tifo from uh, from Canada, for, from the center uh, uh, from the research center of, of renewable materials at Laval University in Quebec, and she's an assistant professor there at the Department of Wood and Forest Science, um, and she's also scientific director of Poremontmorency, which is the largest research forest in the world. Uh, interesting. Um, and her research focuses really on the mobilization of the forest sector for the transition of the global energy system and climate change mitigation. 
So th this work was done uh, by Evelyn uh, together with Shap uh, 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 and, and, and Mahmoud and uh, some other people from uh, University of British Columbia, and uh, as well as uh, Antti Asikainen and jo Johanna Rauta from Luc in Finland. Um, Evelyn, the floor is yours. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you, Yap. Um, so as uh, uh, Yap uh, just uh, mentioned, this work uh, was done with uh, uh, colleagues from uh, UBC uh, here in, in Canada and colleagues in, uh, in Finland. And they have uh, both uh, have developed over the past years uh, a lot of uh, field uh, studies that provided uh, data for the, the, the report. Uh, so I'll be talking about uh, uh, woody, uh, woody residues. Um, so just a, a quick uh, overview of, of what uh, exactly uh, the, the feedstock uh, is about uh, here. Um, let's say it's a bit of, of a prelude, prelude to what uh, Michael has been describing. Uh, so I, I'm looking at the, the, the feedstock uh, um, the, for, for, for developing uh, other products. So uh, woody residues can either be used directly for a heat uh, or a power production or as a feedstock for uh, pellets and uh, terrified pellets. Uh, so the different sources of uh, woody residues uh, that we can uh, categorize, uh, uh, so we have uh, primary residues that come uh, directly from uh, forest management uh, activities uh, in the forest. So uh, that resource, um, the, the studies about availability show that uh, it's uh, widely uh, available uh, around, uh, uh, around the world and especially in the uh, in uh, countries like Canada, who has a, a large uh, forest uh, industry. Then we have uh, secondary uh, residues that come from the uh, wood conversion into uh, wood, uh, wood products. And then we have uh, the tertiary uh, residues that are uh, post, uh, post uh, wood products uh, after the, their end, uh, end of life. Um, so the, the, main, um, the main sources of, uh, of uh, woody residues that cause uh, headaches are uh, primary residues and uh, secondary residues. So I'll be uh, focusing uh, more on, on those. Uh, so the main challenge uh, of, uh, of uh, woody residues, and especially those uh, coming uh, directly from, from the forest, so they are uh, extremely abundant, uh, especially across Canada. So you have a, a photo of, uh, of a, a clear-cut area uh, here in Quebec, and so those are all uh, leftover uh, residues on the, the clear that, that have currently no, uh, uh, no use. Uh, so they are abundant, but uh, they are also, uh, uh, they have a low energy and, uh, and, and low uh, bulk density. They are also uh, extremely um, uh, variable in terms of, of uh, properties, because you have a mix of, of species and, and uh, size uh, coming from different uh, tree parts. Uh, they also usually have a high moisture uh, content uh, and a high uh, mineral and nitrogen uh, content, making them uh, a bit difficult to, uh, to convert into energy. And they are uh, highly agroscopic and, and uh, difficult to handle, as you can uh, see on that, um, on that photo. So on one side, they are quite abundant, but the, on, on the other side, uh, they are a, a, tricky, uh, a tricky feedstock. Um, so one, so that's one challenge to to mobilize uh, those uh, residues for uh, uh, for energy. Uh, another challenge in the context, uh, specifically of uh, of Canada, is the the, the quite low uh, uh, energy uh, prices. So we are in a in a market where uh, fossil uh, energies are uh, available at a at a, uh, a low a low price. So. Um, Forest bioenergy to be uh, to be uh, profitable uh, has uh, a quite a, a big challenge to uh, to compete against uh, the, the the in a market with quite a low uh, energy price. So that means that uh, the forest bioenergy sector uh, needs to uh, work on very tight uh, profit margins where you don't have a lot of space for for mistakes. Uh, and when you look at uh, the market for uh, heat. Uh, heat production or power production uh, in Canada, then those prices do not make a lot of room for large investments. So you have to be um, uh, extremely uh, uh, flexible and agile uh, to work in that, uh, in that market. So just show the, the value of energy compared to, uh, to Europe. Uh, 
so in that uh, context uh, where the, 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 the profit margins are, are quite tight, uh, in the case of uh, woody residues, uh, what the literature showed is that we're mostly looking at having very good practices uh, instead of uh, new technology. Uh, so that's what uh, we have, uh, uh, we have uh, found out. Found out. Uh, so you can uh, implement very good uh, practices that uh, help you manage the quality of, uh, of uh, the, the residues in terms of uh, moisture management, uh, physical property management, ash content, and uh, density uh, management. Uh, what we, we find is that a lot of the, the, those very good practices can be implemented uh, at the, the beginning of the value chain, so directly uh, in, the, in the forest, at the forest uh, uh, cut block. Um, Michael mentioned that the, the, the importance of the, the energy that goes into drying when we want to do uh, pellet and uh, uh, clarify the pellet. So uh, a lot of this uh, moisture management can be done uh, directly uh, at the, the, the forest cut block if you want to use uh, uh, primary residues and you can make use of a passive drying uh, using uh, just, uh, just the sun and working with the, the climate. Uh, so for that, it means that uh, you can, if you have a very good integration with uh, forest operations, uh, that, uh, so you can uh, properly pile the, the residues uh, and leave them on site for some months. Uh, so you can have a, a lot of, uh, a good control of uh, moisture content of your uh, residues, but that means that you have to have a very good integration with the, 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 oper the schedule of forest operations for groundwood. And you need to have very good training of the forest operators. So that means close integration with the, 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 the industry of, of uh, wood products that they rely on, uh, on groundwood. Um, the results from different studies in Finland uh, show that uh, you can predict quite well uh, the, um, the evolution of the moisture content of your residues if uh, you can model uh, the, um, the variation in the, in the weather. And quite simple uh, models can be uh, developed based on the, on the weather data. And, and with that, you can predict the, the moisture content of your residues. So you, lose, you leave them for some time on the far right side uh, until they, they reach uh, a low moisture content, and then you plan for their, uh, their chipping and transport uh, to, your, uh, to your plant. Uh, so uh, moisture management through uh, careful prediction. And there's also uh, been a testing of a covering of residue piles uh, in climates like uh, here in Quebec, where you have uh, five meters of snow. Uh, the covering of residues uh, has been shown to be uh, something that can be uh, uh, practical and, and good at, uh, at uh, managing uh, moisture, uh, moisture content. Uh, the chipping of residues also uh, need, uh, it can be uh, carefully planned so that uh, the, the movement of, uh, of machinery and equipment uh, can, can help uh, reduce uh, the cost of, uh, of the, the, the chipping, again, uh, through uh, good integration with uh, the, the rest of the, the forest operation. Uh, then uh, other activi pre-treatment activities uh, can happen in what we call a biomass uh, depot. Uh, so they are centers where you can collect uh, uh, biomass from uh, a larger area uh, into a, a depot where uh, you, you will uh, uh, manage their, their quality. So at uh, uh, such, uh, such depot, uh, the studies that have shown that uh, uh, they, they, they can be quite profitable to add into your, your value chain uh, because they help to buffer against a variation in, uh, in feedstock uh, supply and, uh, and quality. So having a depot like that uh, gives you the space to, um, uh, again, to do passive uh, drying uh, of, your, uh, of your biomass. There's also been a testing of uh, active drying of, of biomass, uh, but uh, the, 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 the economics of active drying is a bit uh, more, uh, more tricky, again, because of the, the low price of, uh, of energy. But then at a depot like that, you can uh, do proper sieving so that you remove uh, the, the particles that are, not, uh, that are either too small or, or too, uh, too big. Uh, and then there's also uh, the use of uh, blending to control the quality of your biomass, so by mixing uh, biomass coming from different sources, 
you can you could reach uh, uh, optimal uh, uh, quality of your uh, of your uh, feedstock. Uh, so that's a way to manage uh, the both the, the moisture ma moisture content of your your biomass by uh, mixing uh, very dry and a bit uh, more wet uh, uh, feedstock, but also the ash content of your uh, of your uh, biomass by mixing uh, different uh, sources. Uh, there's been uh, studies on washing of, uh, of uh, woody residues to um, uh, control the, the, the ash, ash content. So uh, uh, laboratory studies have been uh, successful with uh, washing techniques, but then it, it remains to be seen whether it's uh, worth the, the trouble doing it at a larger scale, uh, because you can still obtain a good result by uh, blending different uh, uh, sources of biomass to reach uh, uh, optimal uh, ash, uh, ash content. Uh, I wanted to give an example that comes from our colleagues in, in the UBC about the implementation of uh, pretreatment uh, practices. Uh, so it comes from uh, at the UBC, they have a, a gasification system that use uh, woody residues coming from the, the, the larger uh, Vancouver area. So they have forest biomass coming from the forest, but also um, uh, woody residues coming from the, the urban uh, area. Uh, so uh, when they implemented the, that, uh, that system in, the, uh, in the, the first month of implementation, they uh, uh, slowly implemented the pretreatment practices in terms of uh, moisture management and physical property management. So it was just uh, uh, getting better at uh, at uh, monitoring the, the, the moisture of the, the feedstock and doing uh, proper uh, sieving. So over the, 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 the course of the first two years, they have gradually uh, implemented those, uh, those uh, practices. And what uh, their data show is that uh, uh, for about the same amount of feedstock, they have uh, significantly increased the steam production from the, their system. So just by gradually implementing uh, very low cost uh, pretreatment practices uh, just uh, by a passive drying and a better uh, sieving of their feedstock. Uh, and so just by implementing those, um, those practices, uh, they have seen an increase in, in profits uh, because of the, the, the increase in, the, in steam uh, production. So they have seen a 16% a uh, profit uh, increase. So with just uh, uh, low, low technology uh, pretreatment uh, practices. And uh, other uh, studies have shown that uh, biomass depot, where you have uh, a better control of your moisture and physical uh, content, uh, uh, also can lead to, uh, to uh, cost reduction uh, in, the, in the order of uh, 11 to 30 uh, percent uh, cost reduction for the, 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 the cost of your, of your feedstock. Uh, so that's so that's all uh, uh, for me, so I will pass it back to, uh, to Yap. Yes, thank you, Evelyn. Uh, the next one is, uh, uh, is by Kevin Whitty from the University of Utah. Uh, he, he did uh, a case study together with uh, people from uh, Sweden, Germany, and Italy on uh, the treatment of MSW of gasification. Uh, uh, for the next couple of speakers, I would like to ask you also to uh, Stick to your time uh, so that we uh, we end at around uh, five o'clock or so. Um, Kevin, the floor is yours. Thank you. Yeah, uh, I, was, I assume everyone can hear me. So um, I'd like to uh, thank the co-authors here, Inge, and, and in particular Dieter and Giovanni. They did the, the bulk of the work. Uh, I just sort of kind of combined all their efforts together and, and tidied it up. So what I'll be presenting today is primarily the, the work of Dieter and, and Giovanni. Um, the, the idea behind this project is that for gasification systems, we've conventionally used uh, traditional biomass resources, which are quite expensive. Um, they work well in a gasification system, but it, it's challenging to make the economics work. So what we proposed was to use MSW as a feedstock. There's some interesting economic advantages to that, which I'll talk about a little bit later. Uh, but it, it's, it's certainly a very challenging uh, feedstock in gasification systems. Biomass gasification systems tend to be either fluidized bed or fixed bed systems. And so when you start to throw in a very heterogeneous feedstock, such as MSW, municipal solid waste, 
uh, it can create uh, operational challenges. So the idea was to see if there's something that can be done to pre-treat the MSW to make it more amenable for, for operation in a gasification system. So looking at uh, the difference between the properties of sort of raw municipal solid waste versus what, for example, a circulating fluidized bed gasifier needs, uh, you can see that there's several of the properties where MSW is not appropriate, and those are highlighted in red in the table there. So in terms of size, uh, the ash content, um, and then some things like mercury and even the bulk density of the material, MSW tends to be very light and fluffy just due to the nature of the materials that are, that are in there. Um, so you can pre-treat or upgrade the MSW, and some of these technologies are well recognized, and in fact, some of the ones that were spoken about earlier during this presentation might be suitable. But we focused on a couple of different technologies. Um, and when, when you upgrade MSW, you end up with either refuse-derived de fuel or RDF. There's no particular specification for that, or the other one that's more common is, is SRF, which is solid recovered fuel. That has particular specifications regarding its property and size and, and things like that. So uh, the, uh, basically the scope was to focus on the two pretreatment technologies of mechanical pretreatment. I will point out that we, by design, focused on relatively Simple pretreatment methods. Uh, there, there are more advanced pretreatment methods that perhaps would give a little bit better properties, but might be a little less realistic for an industrial application. So we focused on mechanical and then mechanical biological pretreatment, and then the gasifier that was given consideration is this uh, fluidized bed gasifier in Rudersdorf, Germany. Um, and then the, the two cases were Germany and Italy, which are the c home countries of Dieter and Giovanni, the primary authors of the study. Uh, and then there was a preliminary economic assessment, which I'll talk about in a couple slides. Uh, the, the graph there just shows, for example, in the case of Germany, in about 2005, the uh, uh, German government instituted uh, incentives, I'll say, for, for increasing the uh, use of solid waste in uh, energy production systems. And so the, the blue one in particular, the RDF in power plants, you can see that that has risen quite a lot. That's primarily been uh, incinerators, but there should be opportunities for gasifiers as well. So mechanical pretreatment, just the, the manner in which it uh, is, is conducted, there's multiple stages. So there's crushing, and then you remove basically all the uncombustible components, glass, stone, ceramics, things like that. Ferrous metals, which can be sent to recycling, for example, can be removed magnetically. Uh, other metals can be removed, uh, for example, using an eddy current separator. And then finally, once all those materials that are uncombustible have been sorted out, then there's a secondary crushing, which finally makes it appropriate for uh, feed into a gasification system. And the final fuel then has much lower ash content. And you remember from the previous slide, the ash content was one of the challenges with these waste fuels. And then also the heating value is, is higher. So that's how the MS, the, or the, the mechanical pretreatment works. Mechanical biological has some similarities, but it combines some biological treatment. And the biological treatment, depending on how the system is configured, can take place either before or after the mechanical pretreatment. Uh, the advantage here is you end up with multiple product streams. So there's a recyclable materials, biogas from the biological pretreatment, compost, and then finally you end up with the RDF, the refuse-derived fuel, which would then be suitable for uh, uh, gasifier feed. I, I will point out that I'm, I know I'm breezing over these quite quickly, um, but, uh, oops, let me. Turn this off. The, uh, the details of these are in the report, and there's a report associated with all of these pretreatment pro uh, projects. Um, so final slide for me is just an overview of the cost study. So this is considering mechanical uh, pretreatment for uh, feed into this 100 megawatt fluidized bed gasifier. 
and you can see some of the costs, the kind of the uh, the capital costs for the different parts of that system, uh, and then the power that's required. So this cost analysis considered both capex and opex for the system. One of the things that's really uh, uh, attractive about these waste feeds is that you actually, rather than having to pay for high quality biomass fuels, you receive a, a tipping fee. So someone is paying you to take those materials. Uh, there is some cost associated with landfill of the non-combustible materials and whatnot. Um, but overall, the, the result is that the, uh, the treatment costs are about 10, ton, uh, 10 euros per ton. But you get a gate fee, in, the, in this particular case in Germany, of about 100 euros per ton. So overall, it looks like it's, it's quite an attractive uh, case. I, I should point out that this isn't the see-all and end-all to this, but this was sort of just a preliminary case, uh, cost case study. And anything more would have to you know, have more details in the particular configuration and waste stream. That is the end of, of uh, what I have. So I will turn it back over to you, Jan. Thanks a lot, uh, Kevin, for that. Very, very clear also. Uh, we'll, we'll proceed to the next uh, case study by, uh, by Marcel Kramer, who will present uh, on behalf of DMDGL. Marcel is a uh, business lead uh, or senior consultant at, consultant at uh, DMDGL since uh, 2006. Uh, he has a long uh, background also in uh, biomass combustion and co-firing. He has also been active in Task 32. Um, and uh, uh, Marcel, the floor is yours. Uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you very much for the introduction. Yes, this case study is about uh, the steam explosion process for coal firing and fuel conversion. Uh, the case study has been uh, analyzed and, uh, and uh, uh, set up together with uh, a few others, which include uh, Travis Robinson, uh, Satna Madrali, and uh, Guy Rigny from Natural Resources Canada, who also performed the techno-economic assessment. Um, then we have in, uh, we have uh, as author also uh, Rob Mega, who provided a lot of input from the OPG side, and we have been visiting uh, Arba Flame, one of the producers of uh, steam explosion pellets, uh, and talked to uh, uh, amongst others uh, Rune Brusletto. So we'd like to thank all these contributors for this uh, for this report. Uh, well, the next slide is that uh, uh, what you see here is that uh, the steam explosion process is a, is a thermal and mechanical process. Uh, so in this process, uh, the biomass is heated uh, in a steam vessel. Uh, the vessel contains steam at a temperature somewhere between uh, 10 and 30 bars and at a temperature uh, between 190 and uh, 230 degrees Celsius. Uh, a certain pressure release releases then a lot of energy, which results uh, in a mechanical degradation of the biomass. Uh, this process is therefore primarily aiming at the uh, lignocellulosic uh, biomass. And uh, once it is, uh, uh, has suffered from this uh, pressure release, uh, the biomass becomes brittle and rigid, and it can be uh, subsequently dried and then pelletized. Okay, also, because uh, the color of the material changes and becomes more black, uh, this is also a reason why it's often referred to as uh, black pellets. Uh, the product can be used as a fuel for replacement uh, of coal in a coal-fired power plant um, and also for other uh, applications. Uh, typically, the process of a steam explosion is uh, a batch slice process, as you also see in the picture, uh, in which you feed one reactor and discharge uh, the same reactor uh, within a certain time, and then the next one. Um, in the top figure, you also see uh, a typical chain for the steam explosion process. So from wood chip harvesting to, uh, to the end consumer. So after the harvesting of the biomass, debris will be removed, and the biomass is shredded into smaller pieces. And then the biomass is fed into the steam explosion vessel. Uh, you see it here as the conditioning step in the, uh, uh, in, in the picture. Uh, and after the steam explosion process, the biomass is dried and then pelletized. And then they are considered as black pellets, which are ready to be transported to a uh, coal-fired power plant. Now, it's not a new process. Eh? So the, the steam explosion process is something which has already been researched for uh, several decades. It was already commercially used in the 1950s 
as a means for preparing waste wood for hardboard manufacturing. It also has been used as a pretreatment means for uh, lignocellulosic feed for cattle. Uh, so then the cattle can uh, more easily digest uh, this, uh, this feed. Uh, it also has been used as an alternative for thermal mechanical pulping. And it has also been uh, researched uh, recently quite a lot for, uh, as, a, as a method to incre increase biogas yields and fermentations and for increasing uh, ethanol yields. Uh, there's a lot of research being done, and we see that, uh, that uh, already in the period 2014 to 2017, there's about 1,700 uh, publications within uh, Alpovir's the Science Direct environment. So if you then look at the, at the product, uh, at the pellets, so what do they look like? Uh, what are the specifications? Well, typically, the color value of these pellets is in the range of 17 to 19 megajoules per kilogram on an as received lower cal calorific heating value basis. This is slightly higher than that of wood pellets. Uh, the moisture content is relatively low and the volatile content is what you would expect for a biomass of this calorific value. The bulk density is comparable slightly higher of that of wood pellets. Uh, and as the pellets should be hydrophobic, it is the idea that the pellets can be stored uh, outdoors and do not need a lot of infrastructure modifications to a coal plant and co-filing the biomass. Is this true? Are downstream investments avoided? That's then the question. So we had a lot of interaction also with the Ontario Power Generation, and they have experience with this uh, uh, material. And as you can see from the slide here, it shows the difference between two conversions that OPT performed for two different coal-fired generating stations. Uh, the left one is the Epicoken generating station that has uh, been completely converted to white wood pellets in 2013 and the course of 2014. Uh, this conversion included uh, new silos and modified burners. Uh, the total project duration was about 18 months, and the total conversion cost amounted about 170 million Canadian dollars. Uh, the power plant is operational, uses 100% uh, wood pellets, and can dispatch electricity whenever that is needed. Uh, the Thunder Bay power plant, uh, however, was also converted, but then into a peaking plant in uh, 2015. Uh, the electricity was generally needed in the winter, for example, when the lakes could become frozen and a longer term storage was needed. And also because the conversion must be a low capex conversion, it was required to have fuel that could easily uh, be stored outdoors, also for an extended period of time and at low fixed cost. So for this purpose, OPG has chosen to use steam explosion pellets. Uh, the conversion included only minor modifications, mainly to suppress the production and spread of dust and reduce the risk of fire. Uh, the overall conversion cost were around $3 million, and the plant outage times were much shorter than that of the Etikoka generating station. So OPG's experience was very positive, and we can conclude from this that the black pellets can be used with minimal investment cost for plant modifications. Well, I said uh, one of the most important items is the durability of the pellets. Uh, so in the case study, we discussed several uh, technical items of these pellets and operation as well. But an important one is the durability. This has to do with the outdoor storage and the integrity of the pellets. Uh, so uh, these pellets need to retain their shape and their sturdiness, and for that, OPG executed weatherability tests. Uh, the pellet durability was measured on pellets that have been soaked in water over different durations, and the test showed that the durability of the test has been maintained. The picture shows the pellets after the weathering test, uh, and uh, also uh, how, yeah, how, how they then look. So in real life operations, the pellets remain also durable, and OPG also performed dust generating tests. And these tests showed the same level of dust formation as you would have with power river base and lignite coal. Um, there was certain uh, uh, modifications with regard to dust suppression and earthing systems, and steam uh, conditions were checked. Uh, also, that found that steam temperatures uh, were more or less comparable with those during coal operations. So, in the end, we conclude that uh, at power uh, thunder power. Bay power station, the black pellets could be stored outdoors for a longer duration with no significant impact on plant operations. 
So finally, it comes to the cost of the pallet itself. Uh, so can these black pallets compete with wood pallets on a cost per gigajoule basis? And so uh, a technoeconomic assessment uh, was done. And the assessment showed that the steam explosion process uh, requires additional costs for infrastructures and operations compared to the wood pallets. Um, the energy density of the black pallets is uh, slightly higher than that of the, of the wood pallets. Uh, but, and in the end, uh, the savings on logistics that, that come with these uh, high energy density uh, are expected that they not completely can um, uh, compensate for the higher cost for producing uh, these fuels. Uh, still, of course, you have hardly any uh, cost at the power plant. Uh, so then especially this uh, becomes an attractive op option for, uh, for plants that have uh, part load operations or picking plants. Okay, clear, uh, Marcel. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, we go straight on, on to the last presentation of the day, which is by uh, Koen Meesters from uh, Wageningen University. Uh, and he will talk about uh, leaching of, uh, of biomass to improve the chemical uh, performance. Uh, Koen, the floor is yours. Thank you, Jaap, for your introduction. I hope uh, everybody can hear me. Um, at least to start with, talk, start with the first uh, slide. Um, there we go. So uh, why is leaching of herbaceous biomass a good idea? If we look at uh, the lignocellulosic biomass potential in the European Union, then we can see there is a lot of wood from forests, but almost more than all of, this, of that is used. And the other forest biomass residues are also uh, largely used, but then the agricultural residues, there's a lot of potential and it's hardly used. So there is a big option. The wastes are almost uh, fully used and crop biomass is uh, not used to its potential, but there you would have uh, yeah, problems with uh, that, that the biomass will be more expensive and you also might have, may have problems with uh, uh, indirect land use change issues. Then the challenges for incineration of herbaceous biomass, there are several. Uh, one of them is uh, chlorine. Chlorine is, uh, ascent, is, uh, depends on the soil that the biomass is grown. And uh, it should be re reduced usually by a factor of 10. Um, then we go to potassium. Potassium is essential for the growth. But it, and it, during the incineration, it causes corrosion and fouling. And also a reduction by a factor of 10 is needed. Sodium is again is then uh, depending on the on the soil quality and gives the same problems as potassium and also a reduction is needed. Nitrogen is essential for the growth and causes NOx emissions and uh, you can prevent that with uh, with cleaning methods. Um, then the ash content of the biomass depends again on the soil, on the species, and also on the tissue of the plant that is used. And this lowers the efficiency and may also uh, cost money to, to get rid of it, depending on the quality of the ash. And here, reduction is uh, desirable in most cases. And we come to countercurrent extraction. With countercurrent extraction, we can remove uh, mainly potassium and chloride, so the soluble uh, pollutants. Uh, the biomass in this uh, equipment moves from left to right, and the liquid moves from right to left. And this way, the liquid comes into contact with the clean biomass first, then with a bit more dirty biomass, and in the end, it comes into contact with the dirty biomass. This way, we need little uh, liquid, and we get a, a concentrated extract. And this concentrated extract is handy as a, maybe may handy as a fertilizer. Uh, at the bottom, you see experimental set up at the Wageningen University Research Center, uh, where we have uh, 27 automated valves to uh, organize the simulated moving bed uh, operation. And we use large ball valve valves to prevent clogging so that we can uh, use re real biomass in this equipment. This shows a, a result of an extraction, a repeated extraction of empty fruit bunches 
we filled a, a column with empty fruit bunch, and we have extracted that with water. We did that four times, so we took fresh water, then we uh, extracted the biomass, then we took another time fresh water and extracted the biomass again. And what you can see here is the connectivity uh, development in time in the extract. You can see that an equilibrium is reached after approximately 0.5 hours, and that the connectivity at the end of each stage or each extraction is uh, reduced by 50%. So each time you do, you do this extraction, the connectivity of the liquid goes down by a factor two. This is the same, basically the same experiment, but now we are looking at the extracts. We have ac uh, analyzed the extracts for chemical oxygen demand, potassium, connectivity, and chloride. And uh, here we see that the connectivity is a good proxy, root proxy for potassium and chloride, but that is nice. And we also see that all of those go down uh, by a, a factor of 10 after four extractions, so the, the liquid has less and less uh, potassium and chloride in it. Then we have sent the extracted empty fruit bunch to SGS for analysis. We can see that the ash content has been reduced significantly. We also see that the chloride concentration has dropped uh, by more than a factor of 10, so that is great. We see that potassium and Sodium are both reduced. They are reduced by a six factor of uh, potassium is reduced by a factor of 6.5. So it's not a factor 10, but it's uh, more than halfway. And uh, maybe a few extra extractors will uh, make it complete. Then we translated this experiment into a feasibility in an industrial setting. We've looked at an EFB uh, washing process. We first start with a press. This press presses out the water and some of the remaining oil from the empty fruit bunch. Then there's a shredder to reduce the size of the empty fruit bunch. Then the countercurrent liquid separation extraction is done. And then the resulting biomass is pressed again to make it uh, dry enough to uh, further dry it and to make pellets out of it. We've assumed that we have 40 kilotons of dry matter per year. That we need 10 stages in a countercurrent system. That we use heap leaching, so that's very cheap. We basically put the, uh, the biomass on heaps on a concrete floor, and we spray water of it like over it like a like a shower. And we also assume that the washing water can be used for irrigation at zero costs. Made a small cost estimate, and we estimate that the investment is 940 kilo euros and that operation costs are 73 kilo euros a year. And if you add that together as lump sum costs, you get to uh, 6.5 euros per ton of dry matter. And the conclusions, large amount of agro re residues are available and not used. This myomass needs to be upgraded. Ash, potassium, chlorine uh, may be strongly reduced by washing with water. Countercurrent extraction strongly reduces the amount of extraction liquid. The costs are reasonable in view of the total biomass supply chain. That was my talk, so I will give the word back to Jaap. Thanks a lot, uh, Koen, for that. Uh, that was very clear. Uh, with that, I'd like to, uh, to just draw two general conclusions uh, before we go to the Q&A session. Uh, the first one, uh, the first slide on this is that, well, to summarize, it's important to, that we Diversify the resource base. Uh, we go to lower grades of biomass and uh, reduce logistical expenses and increase the fuel flexibility of uh, various uh, existing conversion technologies. Herbaceous biomass is, uh, is, is the elephant in the room, I would say. There's a lot of, of it available. Uh, and also, on the other hand, we have a lot of uh, coal-based power stations. And, and uh, also in the industry, there's a large demand for coal, which uh, which, which can accommodate uh, uh, alternative fuels. Um, there's a lot of pretreatment uh, technologies available, a wide portfolio. Some, some is very uh, uh, commercially available already, but some is new or uh, advanced, like the leaching technology, for example. 
uh, we, we can improve we are able to improve the chemical characteristics uh, for example by leaching but also uh, 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 weathering outside like with uh, the forest residues that we heard about um, then the logistical challenges can be uh, can be improved by uh, increasing the, the density through baling or pelletization, maybe uh, thermal pretreatment first, uh, either steam explosion or torrefaction. Um, can then also create a fuel that is more closely uh, related to the original fossil fuel, like coal, and that, uh, that uh, increases the, the performance of the plant or reduces the need for other infrastructure. Uh, having said that, uh, we see already happening, of course, that there's a lot of uh, uh, white wood pellets being traded. And uh, if coal-fired power plants are converting already to wood pellets, white wood pellets, uh, they become less attractive to target with black pellets because they are, uh, as we can say, locked into uh, the, the more expensive uh, 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 route uh, in some cases. Um, and of course, there's um, also policy instruments uh, uh, required to accelerate the uh, uh, deployment of such uh, innovative uh, pretreatment technologies. Uh, having said that, uh, I think I would like to, uh, to thank all the speakers in this session um, and uh, open up the, the Q&A session uh, <coughs> uh, here. So if you have any questions, please uh, use the chat box and type in your questions there. If uh, it's possible, we can then try to, to answer it uh, or have any of the speakers respond to your questions. Are there any questions? But this is Michael Wilt, and if I may pick up the two questions which are here on, on porified and white wood pellets, I start with the one of uh, put by, by Jeff Passmore. Should we be comparing torrefied wood pellets to fossil rather than white wood pellets? Should we shouldn't we be shooting each other? Um, I completely agree. I mean, the the, uh, the, the there is no um, uh, way that torrefied pellets would uh, shoot on wood white wood pellets. We see white wood pellets market developed, and this is a market which will continue uh, to, to to flower. Torrefied wood pellets. Uh, are, uh, however, the next step to really substitute coal in large volumes, in much larger volumes than white wood pellets ever could do. And especially because, and that was proven in the study, because of the big advantages uh, in uh, the logistical chain. And that is literally also a little bit the, the, uh, the um, answer to the second question by uh, Paula Bianco. Um, the um, factors along this logistics chain of torrefied pellets or to torrefied briquettes are almost similar to those of standard steam coal. So we uh, reach uh, bulk densities of about uh, 800 to 850 kilograms if uh, briquetted and torrefied product can be uh, tailor-made. So by dialing in temperatures and residence time, we could produce uh, torrefied uh, wood with 22 gigajoule, but up to 27, 28. And there are some producers already at uh, 30 gigajoule per ton. So this becomes a real coal substitute and a one-to-one -one exchange with uh, all the cost factors being the same along the handling uh, and, and, and logistical chain. I mean, still, to dug out coal from the soil is a cheaper thing than harvesting trees and processing trees. Um, however, if we end then and then uh, get the loop to the last presentation of leaching the agro-materials, I mean, this is the perfect input then for torrefied material and here. I think we might come close of direct con cost competitiveness uh, with um, coal at today's abundant and by these almost free resources of agro byproducts. Hope that answered the questions. Okay, um, Marcel Kremers here from case study four on the steam explosion. There's one question regarding steam explosion process. And the question is, steam explosion is done after or before pelletizing. 
uh, the steam explosion process takes place before the pelletizing. First steam explosion, then drying, and then, uh, then pelleting. Okay, we have a question here from Boya Robinson. Is there a difference between sorting, segregation, and crushing in the pretreatment of municipal solid waste? So I believe that's a question uh, for you, Kevin. Sure, yeah, I'm happy to answer that one. Um, the, uh, this is the, the question regarding the MSW upgrading. Um, the, uh, the technologies that were, were presented um, for mechanical pretreatment are fairly well established, and it, it would be a mistake, I think, to introduce straight MSW into uh, a system without doing some sort of pretreatment, just because there, there is such a high non-combustible component. Um, this this uh, comment by, by uh, Boy Robertson mentioned 37 to 42 percent organic, so that would imply that 60 percent of it is non-organic or non-combustible. Uh, so you'd certainly want to separate that out. Um, I would, yeah, I would encourage the mechanical pretreatment as sort of low-hanging fruit. It's established technology. The uh, equipment to achieve that is is available sort of off the shelf as it is today. Okay, thank you very much. And we have a question there from um, El Vado. So in the chat pod, the use of AFEX pretreatment has already been considered. I'm not sure who would be able to best fill that question there. So can any of the speakers online fill that question? So we'll go to our next question from Hossein. So Mr. Meesters, which methods did you use uh, to measure the inorganic composition of the fuels? Was it ICP or XRS? Did you check the accuracy and the deviation of the reported data? Thank you. So I think that's a question for you, Marcel. Or sorry, for Colin, rather. Um, yeah, that's, I think, think it's indeed a question for me. I already answered it in the chat box. Oh, okay. I, I also saw a then. question about upcycling of agro-materials by Rogini. Okay. Um, and I think that uh, this is a, a delicate question. Many of the farmers say, we need all this material to, to keep the uh, soil okay. But we have doubts whether you would need all the biomass to do that. So we, we, we are convinced that we can at least take part of the biomass from the field to, the, to be burned uh, elsewhere without any problems. OK. Thank you very much. And so for the, for the, for the there from, oh, yep, go ahead. Yeah, for the specific case of empty fruit bunches, the, the empty fruit bunches are considered to be a problem because uh, the, the field is already full with fronds and trunks and other stuff. Uh, so the, the, the farmers do not like any other organic material. So it's really a leftover. OK, thank you, Kuhn. Okay. Uh, there was a question from, uh, from Jamie, uh, whether uh, a, uh, AFEX, which is ammonia explosion, could be applied. And uh, I think, uh, Marcel, you have? Yes, we didn't look into that. No, we didn't, didn't look into that. So um, I said that Jamie also has another question still on the, uh, on the pelleting. Uh, less erosive and uh, does not need binds. Uh, that is correct. Uh, the pelleting of the uh, of the steam uh, exploded material is uh, is usually without any any binder. Yeah. Okay. Thank you for that, uh, Marcel. Um, let's see what other questions we have. Um, Uh, 
Uh, there is already a discussion with Evelyn uh, ongoing. Um, maybe Evelyn, can you uh, share your thoughts on this question? Yeah, so it was about the, the coordination. It was about the coordination of uh, uh, timber uh, harvesting activities with uh, the management of the forestry uh, residues. Uh, and the, the examples uh, from uh, Scandinavian countries show that uh, uh, you need to uh, have additional training of the operator that does the, the, the clear cutting of trees so that they properly uh, pile uh, and sort the residues uh, by the, the, the skidding tracks in your, your clear cut uh, operation to make it easier uh, for the, the residues to uh, do uh, to dry uh, by, by themselves. Uh, so you need to have um, additional training of your, uh, of your operators for, for that to make, it, uh, to make it easier for the drying and also for the, the picking up. And then you can also uh, time the, the operations so that you have uh, enough uh, months uh, for the, the, the residues to, to properly dry before you, you, pick, uh, you pick them up. So uh, clear cutting in areas where you plan um, to collect the, the, the residues, uh, you schedule them so that they, they will uh, be able to, to dry for, for several months before, for example, uh, uh, you, you pick them up, so you have to, to time the, the clear cut the schedule with the operation of your um, uh, bioenergy plan. Okay, thank you for that, uh, Evelyn. I um, not see any new questions. That there was one question about uh, whether there were success stories on waste or energy in the African context. Um, uh, I don't know whether we had any. Uh, whether there is any any of the speakers uh, capable of answering that question, that was not really the topic of the of the, of the webinar, I'm afraid. But um, is there anyone that can say something about this? I, I, I'm afraid there's nobody um, that can, can do that, but uh, there is a task on, uh, on waste uh, management uh, within IA Bioenergy, uh, and uh, I would advise you to contact uh, the task leader of that, so that's task 36. Uh, please have a look at, um, uh, at the IA Bioenergy website for their contact details. Um, so there are seen a new question coming in from Ragini uh, on the calculation of the estimated potential of agro-materials, if it, in, if it included uh, superfluous materials or all agricultural waste. Um, and I think, Kun, you're answering this question. Can you maybe talk over the phone? About what? About the last question, whether um, uh, uh, your, I think this was related to your potential uh, estimation for agro-materials. Um, I'm not sure if I completely it, it, understand the question, uh, question correctly, but uh. okay, it, it it does indeed also uh, include things like uh, like straw, so normal crops that have a side product that is usually plowed into the ground, and we are convinced that it's not necessarily not necessary. To plow, plow everything into the ground, so you can harvest at least part of the biomass without any troubles. Uh, the soil uh, fertility or the carbon content of the soil, but that depends, of course, on the soil and on the crop and on the conditions. Yeah. Okay. Okay, thank you for that, uh, Kuhn. Uh, I see that Kevin is now uh, leaving the leaving the meeting. Uh, we are also uh, uh, already over our time, so um, I wonder if there are any other relevant questions for now. Otherwise, uh, can maybe uh, end the meeting.
Yeah, so the, the, I think the discussion is still, on, still ongoing, but uh, uh, at the moment I don't see any uh, any relevant questions any longer. So um, maybe Natasha, uh, uh, how do we end from here? Yes, for sure. So um, just a reminder that if you still haven't filled out for the participants the poll on the left-hand side, um, it is still open if you wanted to um, put in your poll, your vote on which sector best represents the nature of your work. So you have a few moments left to do that. And uh, while we do that, just a reminder that the session is being recorded and will be available on the IA Bioenergy website for future reference uh, for any participants that may have missed the session or want to refer back to it for future reference. And so if there are no more questions, I'd like to bring this session to a close. Um, thank you all for participating in today's webinar, and thank you very much again to all the speakers for their great presentations and case studies. Um, this was the IA Bioenergy webinar series hosted by the Canadian Institute of Forestry. And have a great day. Thank you very much, everyone. Yes, I, I'd like to also uh, thank all of the speakers. Uh, uh, thank you for, uh, for attending, and also uh, thank you for all of the participants to attend. And uh, I hope to talk to you again. Thank you. Bye, everyone.